So uh, it's episode 384 with Becky Fawcett, who is the founder of HelpUsAdopt.org and is also a friend of mine. I've been friends with her for a really, 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 really long time. I feel like I've, I've known you since you started your journey. I have. I went Probably. to your first fundraisers. And so I want you to tell us, for one, we're going to hear about a little bit of your backstory. So Becky, you grew up in Philadelphia, met your husband, had an idyllic, I mean, I'm doing this in air quotes, childhood. Some might judge it as that. You're probably like maybe not as idyllic as people. No, you know, listen, we 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 talk about um yeah, on paper, it's like perfect. We talk about the privilege all the time. Like the, it, it was just, um, yeah, it's real. You know, you got to talk about these things. Right. Got to talk right. about these things. And then you but, met your beautiful husband. Met my husband in college. You know, we were like the perfect couple with, I hate that word, perfect. It's like so shitty. Am I allowed to curse on your podcast? Of course. Yes. Yes. <laughs> But I have to tell you, when you see them, they're like Barbie and Ken. I mean, literally, you guys are like Barbie and Ken. I mean, would you agree? I have referred to myself as Barbie and Ken before because, you know, it really hits the stereotype home. And, you know, listen, I I was a publicist. He was a banker. I'm blonde. He's J. Crew. But here's the, here's the knocker on all this. Like, you know, everybody would be like, ugh, you have the perfect life. Ugh, you have the perfect life. Ugh, you have the perfect life. Ugh, can't have a baby. Can't have a baby. One of the biggest imperfections that no one wants to talk about, like nothing I had could have fixed that problem. Um, you know, and I just did, I, I just did, I do these things on my Instagram called 30 Seconds with Becky Fawcett. And the one I did yesterday was I just, you know, my oldest daughter's about to turn 18. And I've been thinking so much about how on earth it's been 18 years, um, even longer in trying to have the baby. And it's funny that you started out with like my life growing up in this picture perfect life. And I never would have said this growing up. I never would have said it in my 20s. I wouldn't have said it even in my 30s largest privilege in my life that will never ever be topped is the fact that I was able to afford adoption and become a mother to my two girls through adoption. It's the greatest privilege out of everything I've ever been privileged to have, you know, and, um, and helping others get this privilege of parenthood is my other greatest privilege through help us adopt. And, you know, it's funny because I have a a renegade 17 year old who like is like hate privilege and I'm like well you have to use privilege for good I mean I can't help how where I was born I work really hard for my life all these things but I said but we used I used my privilege to start this national organization that has given away over six million dollars in 16 years and helped to build like 662 families through adoption like through these grants and None of that would have been possible had I not had my life on the other side. I wouldn't have had the time to dedicate to this. I wouldn't have been able to work for free for the first seven years. I wouldn't have been able to do any of it. Um, so it just, it's interesting what people think is your life, what your life really is. Um, you know. What, so when you found out, like you go to the doctor and you're like, I've been trying to have a baby. My husband and I do this all the time. We have sex all the time. And because he's so cute, I'm sure you do, or you did at that point too. Um, and you were like, why isn't it working? And the doctors were like, it's not him. It's not you. Or what did they say? It was both of us. It was both of us. Um, and then I couldn't hold it. I did get pregnant. So I did five rounds of IVF. I got pregnant three times out of the five rounds. And I had three miscarriages, one at 16 weeks, one at 12 weeks, one at 10 weeks. And what I like to tell people is this, that's a horrific fact in itself, three miscarriages. And the 16 week one, uh, let me just say, um, you know, it, it, I was so skinny when I got pregnant the first time. I was probably like 110 pounds, which is 15 pounds less than I weigh. It was little. And 
I, I gained so much weight in that first trimester. Cause I was like, this baby's going to stick. I mean, I worked so hard for this baby and it did not stick and it was horrible. And, but at the end of all of that, the five rounds of IVF, the three pregnancies, the three miscarriages, when you're infertile, that came with a price tag of $82,000. So that's that. And that was out the window. And then the reason we started look to adoption was many, many reasons, but a driving force was the fact that we only had $40,000 left in our savings. So that was an adoption back in 2005. And um, so that was part of the reason. And the interesting thing in all this is, I'm sure you're going to ask me this question down the road, but for your listeners, you know, I needed to be a mom then, like now. So I did the adoption, but in my head, I kept thinking, I'll do IVF again. I know I can do it. And the long story short to this, and we can talk about it in more detail, is when it came time for a sibling, it didn't matter. I got it. I got it. What is that thing? You understood the assignment. Um, it, my assignment here was to become a mother through adoption and love that child as if it is your own, which it is your own. But that's what the judge says is when they hit the gavel, when you finalize, they go, now, when I hit this gavel, it's as if this kid came out of your body. And I'm like, hit the um, you know, so I got it. Motherhood for me was about something bigger. It was about something bigger than just being pregnant. And so, um, that's my story. And then help us adopt came because I said, holy crap, what are other people doing who are not in my shoes, who maybe don't have this savings. And let's be honest, I only had the savings because of my husband. I, you know, I, I would have had a closet full of nicer bags and nicer shoes had I not have my husband making me save money. Um, I am that girl. Sorry, and uh, when, sorry not sorry. And when you were, when you got this diagnosis or when you lose these babies and you didn't go and turn to a bottle of vodka, you didn't go and turn mm -hmm to drugs how mm -mm. why what did so, you turn to i will tell you i did turn to expensive handbags i do like expensive handbags so i have never had that drug or alcohol urge i mean not that i haven't drunk had drinks in my past i i do have drinks never really done drugs at all um i do like to shop and what kip and i did was we turned to travel we went on trips. We had all the, we were charging everything. <laughs> so we had a crazy amount of points. And so when we had a miscarriage, we'd go to Paris. I mean, and it was awful. I, I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, Elizabeth, it was very dark. And had I, again, this was, I started to try to have a baby back in 2001. So that was a long time ago. And if we all think these topics are taboo now, imagine what it was, what is 20, that, 22 years ago? 22 years yeah. ago. Mm -hmm. No one wanted to talk about this. So I was probably, let's be totally honest, I was probably in a very dark depression, very dark. Should I have been on medication? Possibly, but it wasn't really discussed in that manner back then it was discussed as you are a bitter ungrateful woman who's jealous of other people having I mean it was horrible what people said and for those people who said these things about me if they think I don't know it they're fools you know if you're willing to say it out loud it's coming back to you um I know what they said behind my back and it it's a sorrow being infertile when you want to be a mother is a sorrow that is unique to its own. And only anybody listening to this podcast right now who either has watched someone go through it or done it themselves is like, I get that. I get that. It's like a death, um, which is probably not the right comparison for people who've lost people. They're all going to come at me and say, it's not a death, but it's like, you know, I've talked about it with my oldest daughter when she was younger. And I used to say like, it was the death of a dream. And what that genius kid said to me when she was probably like 11 was, but mom, it was the birth of a new dream. I mean, from the mouths of babes, right? Like, but I couldn't see it because 
no one was talking about this. No one was talking about, yes, the world is telling you you have to do it this way, but you, Becky Fawcett, get to do it this way. And that's actually going to make you great. It's going to make your story great. It's going to give you some great, powerful tools that enable you to go out and actually build something that changes the world for people. And, but I didn't see that because I was too, you know, I was too in that, I was too deep in that world of like, I'm not going to talk about it. No one wants to talk about it. People are talking behind my back. People are saying horrible things about me. People know my business. Um, I can't do one more shot. All these things. So who did you talk to? Who would you talk to that you would say, this is how I'm feeling besides- You know, I had a very close friend. I had a very close friend. I'm not gonna lie to you. Ready for this story? Thank God you're sitting down because like you won't believe this. So I had a very close friend who I really was confiding in and we would go on walks and I would cry throughout the whole goddamn walk. I would just sob behind my glasses and she would just sort of walk behind me and hold me upright and listen. Like, that's an intimate friendship. That is like a moment between two women. I'm going to get upset talking about it because she was my rock throughout all this. And on the day of my first transfer, which is when the, the egg has been taken out of you, it has been fertilized in a dish, the embryo is growing, they're going to transfer it back into you and you start to pray. She says, I want to come over before you go. And I said, great. I thought she was coming over to wish me well. I'm like, Kip comes home from work. I worked at home at the time. We're having lunch. We're like trying to breathe. She comes over. She stands in front of me and she starts rubbing her belly. I just wanted to tell you I'm pregnant. Are you kidding? Yeah. Yeah. She chose that. My rock, cho- another woman, chose that moment in time. Not the day before, not the week before, not the week after, not even five. She sent me into probably at the moment, the most important moment of my personal female life. With that, I told her to get the F out of my house. I've never talked to her again. That was the end of that. I mean, who does that? That's what, like, this motherhood business is so sickeningly competitive. It's gross. And I have tried to, with my platform, to support, like, I always tell people, I was just at an event in Greenwich, Connecticut, two weeks ago. And I had to speak in front of 25 women that I didn't know at all. And I said to them, I go, I just want you all to know, for a lot of people who meet me for the first time, you think... You all think you're here and I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable. And I'm going to tell you that adoption is the only way you build your family. It's not what I do. It's the adoption is the way some people build their family. We at this organization have identified thousands of people who want to and need to build their family through adoption, but they need a little bit of money. That's what I'm talking to you about. So again, like I'm not here to tell people This is how you have to build your family. I am here to support women having babies, building their family the way they are. Like your heart, I did it the wrong way. Your heart and your head have to be on the same page, right? And if that means you keep going with IVF, great. If that means you want to do surrogacy and you have enough money to do surrogacy because it's really expensive, great. All these things. Like if you choose not to have children because breaking the biological chain is more than you can work with. I support you. Like I support people in all of this. And these women who are so competitive with all these things, it's so mean. Like it's just downright mean. I don't know who has the time in the day to be so mean about having a baby. Um, You know, and like the first question to people when they hear about a surrogate is like, so did you have to use an egg donor too? It's not your business. Like, it, it's none of your business. If if someone volunteers that information, now I usually ask all these questions to people because I'm 
here in it. So I have a friend who I was just like, I need to hear all the details because actually that helps me understand it. Right. And I love hearing the full, the psychology behind their decision. I, I, they know with me, I'm not asking the question to judge. I'm asking it because it helps me guide people better because people come to me all the time and they're like, I'm not understanding like why I would do surrogacy if I don't care about being pregnant. Why wouldn't I adopt? Again, all these questions are valid, right? Um, some people really want to do surrogacy, but it's close to $200,000. I mean, that costs more than my first house. It's $200,000 to do surrogacy? Unless you go do it like in the Far East, in which... I'm not an expert on that, but it's not necessarily on the up and up. You saw the pictures during COVID. Oh my! There were warehouses of women surrogates that they couldn't, people couldn't come get their babies. Oh my God. Yeah. Betty. So there are ways to do surrogacy for less, but again, you have to be okay with how that works. Um, so when and again, you, everybody makes their own decision. So when you, so when you, you had your last miscarriage and you went to Kip and you're like, this isn't working and you're crying and you're like, what are we going to do? I want, cause we have, the, it's, it's what I, I, I mean, now it might get a little weird, but I'm like, I think yeah. like God makes us to have babies, right? That's a word. So that's, that's the big kicker in the teeth, right? Like male and female, and we can talk about LGBT adoption in a minute, but male and female uh, we were built to reproduce, like whether you believe in the Bible or not, that's not my story. Like it, 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 we were built to reproduce. So when you get married, it was even in our wedding vows from the minister at good old St. David's church. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, they put it in wedding vows when it, I forget the exact wording, it doesn't matter, but like the world is telling you that this is what you have to do and um the new world is saying um you might not be able to do this can you handle it and that's what i talk about all the time because if we talk about it more it's okay it's but not there you know, it's the same way i've always been drawn to you for the way you talk about alcoholism and drug abuse and addiction because this is real this shit happens to people this isn't fun it's not helpful in any way for either group. And if there's shame associated with it on top of it, how the hell are you supposed to get through this, right? Like how the hell are you supposed to get through this dark moment in your life if on top of everything else, it's shameful and secret and you're not allowed to talk about it? I don't so know how you didn't I, pick up a drink. I don't know how you did not go and just say, all right, get me, I, I mean- whatever drug is out there and you just persevered. I mean, you obviously, there's something within you because I wonder how many women drink over the fact that they cannot get pregnant and they feel like they're like, you know, I don't know, the scarlet letters on you. I, I had mean, people, I had countless people say, oh, Becky, how does it feel to have your body fail you? I'm like, no. do you say that to people? Like, are you really, you're saying that to my face, right? Like I'm going through this horrible, horrible thing. And that's what you choose to say to me. Okay. okay so and it made you stronger. It didn't make you weaker. Like it didn't, you didn't. And No, it pissed me off. <laughs> I mean, it really, you know, it really pissed me off. And I think, I think, you know, they say all these things. I don't know. I, I, I have to say like all the crap that happened and all the bullshit that was said to me and the terrible things that were, it started this going, right? I didn't even know what was really happening, but I will tell you this before help us adopt was even real. I decided on the first step that I was going to talk about adoption and I was going to talk about being infertile and I was going to say it out loud a lot. And a lot of people didn't like that. You're making you, me wait, uncomfortable. I, I want it back. I want you to go back. How? So wait a minute. So you find out this has happened. Your family knows. Both of your sides of the family know. And you look at Kip and you say, we're going to adopt. So it's actually the reverse, um, which is a very rare occurrence. He was, was ready to adopt. He was ready to adopt before I was. 
Really? Yep. He hated IVF, hated it, hated it, hated it. And so he was ready to adopt probably about a year before I was. And um, we struck a deal on like the timing. I'm like, I'm not there yet. I need to do this one more time. And then one more time turned into two more times because I got for miracle out of nowhere on the fourth time we got enough eggs for a frozen cycle. So I did it twice. And then I promised him if that last round didn't work, we would adopt. Um, and then, you know, this is where being a pragmatic problem solving person came into play is that like, as the last cycle was happening, it's not that I was negative. It's that I started to say to myself, if this doesn't work, what are the next steps? And I started to do the homework because what I didn't want to have happen. And this is how I live my life. Anybody who's listening, who knows me, is like, no, oh, that's Becky. Um, I didn't want to get this negative answer and then waste six more months figuring out what the hell to do. I wanted to have this one door closed, one door open and move through it. And that's exactly what happened. I had my last miscarriage on Christmas Eve, 2004. I ruined every holiday, every birthday, every everything. Um, and we had our first meeting in January, like the second week with our adoption attorney that we chose and moved forward. And was um, that hard to find? Like, how do you find an adoption attorney if you're so out there? Back then, it was pretty hard to find because no one wanted to talk about this shit. No one, how can no, I even was introduced to adopted people who didn't want to talk about it. Or, you know, I had one friend who introduced me to her adoption attorney. He never called me back. So that pissed me off too. Um, and then when he did finally call me back, he was like, I have like a six week waiting period for a consultation. I'm like, honey, I'm already going to be signing paper. I'm going to be moving. Like, forget it. Forget it. This is my, like, if I'm an afterthought for you, I'm not hiring you. Um, so it wasn't easy to find people. Um, now it's a lot easier. Listen, people, people are talking about it. I, I would, you know, I once had a donor say um, to someone that, Becky Fawcett and help us adopt.org has changed the way our country perceives adoption. It's the highest compliment you could ever give me. That is huge. That is huge. That is huge. It's huge. Um, you know, it's huge. It's people talk about this. I get, I get calls and emails and Facebook messages all the time because like I'm the adoption lady. It's great. So tell me this, you know? when you first went, do you say, I want somebody that, cause I have friends that are gay and I'm like, how do you do it? And they're like, oh, I go to the sperm donor and I want to make sure they're Jewish. They're smart. They have a PhD. They're six, five, da, 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 blonde hair, blue eye. You know, they get to go right. shopping for a baby sperm. I don't think it's the same with adoption. Is it? No. No, I mean, you do have to sort of fill out. They call, it's terrible. You have to, you have to talk about things in adoption that make you feel like a very judgmental person, um, race, gender, drug use. And so we can talk about this now. We can loop my life yeah. into how addiction and alcohol has played a role in my life now. Um, not personally, but personally, if that makes sense, I never want to claim someone else's story for my own or mislead anybody, but it is now part of my family, part of my life. Um, you know, uh, but adoption is a little bit of, and I learned this as a very, you know, I'm a, what's the word? Um, I don't know. I'm very particular. Is that fair? I'm very particular. So I'm very like when I do things in my life, the details are chosen. The details are well thought out. The details are like, I do a certain thing a certain way. Now with adoption, that type A girl had to let go a lot of that control. It's a very hard thing to do for many, many people in adoption. It's probably one of the things I talk about the most with people, um, you're going to have to let go of the control and it might almost kill you, might almost kill you, uh, but you are going to make it. And the thing is, is whether you're religious, which I am not, but I am faithful, if that makes sense. Um, there's a bigger picture here. And I truly believe that Victoria, my oldest daughter's 
birth mother was sent to me and I was sent to her. And the same with Kelly, my youngest daughter's birth mother. Um, and her, my youngest daughter's birth father is still in the picture and we have a relationship with him, Rob. And um, I believe all of this was meant to be. I believe this was a bigger picture journey for me. And whether someone listening to this is, thinks I'm full of it, that's not yours to decide. This is my life. This is how I feel about it all. And um, there are things that have happened in adoption where I'm like, there's no way this is all by chance. There's just no way. There's no way. And, you know, I've had these conversations with the birth parents now, 13 and or almost 14 and 18 years out of the birth. Like, it's just, it was all meant to be. And some terrible things had to happen to both sides in order for it all to happen. But it really is at least for me, has been the most interesting journey of it all, um, of letting go and of learning to love in a different way, of learning to really open up your heart to things that scared the crap out of you. And again, talk we talk about it now, with birth parents and I, they were choosing a stranger to parent their baby. Like, that is some trust, you know, and trust on my side, trust on their side. Um, like we are all a bunch of strangers at the big, not anymore, but at the beginning, we are all a bunch of strangers making some really serious lifelong decisions here. And that is, <laughs> when I look back on it all, I'm like, that's unbelievable. It really is unbelievable. And it takes a lot of love and a lot of faith and a lot of trust and a lot of deep breathing. <laughs> you know a lot of deep breathing did you know now besides the aesthetics meaning the hair and the eyes and all that did you know if there were any mental health issues yeah or the out if they had drank because I understand and I'm not trying to be judgmental on this at all but I know no. like for people that adopt let's say from Russia a lot of these babies yeah. come over with you know, they Fetal are already... alcohol syndrome. Yes, yeah, exactly. a lot of, exactly. yes. So, so the thing about open adoption here in America and versus international adoption. So there is a lot of alcohol abuse internationally. Russia was known for it. Um, it it's terrible. Um, you know, it, drinking while pregnant rewires the fetus body it, it does like ask any it, it does now that's not to say that there aren't tons of people who are like that's my child right like that's my child and they knowingly take it on but again with adoption if it's done right the adoptive parents know the medical situation okay and i will continue to say if it's done right because many international adoptions they don't tell you everything and that's not fair because when you take on a child that was born addicted, depending on the gradation of things, and believe me, I've heard some stories where there have been so many drugs in the fetus, the six pound baby body, they don't even know how to identify what's going on. Uh -huh. um, the, the adoptive parents need to know what they're in for. Now, that all said, it's not judgment, it's what you can handle. And again, I know I'm talking about some things that a lot of people don't want to talk about. And again, bear with me because that's adoption. I believe that when you adopt, you should know what you're getting in for because um, there are some people who cannot handle a situation like that. And that would be unfair to them and unfair to the child mostly. Like the point of adoption is to put the child in a loving and permanent home, in a place where they will thrive. And if the family cannot handle the circumstances that come with the child, that's not a good situation. Now with domestic adoption, it's mostly open these days, mostly, mostly, mostly. So what happens? I will use myself as an example. Um, we said no to alcohol use and um, intravenous drug use. There were some drugs that I had done my research on that really the lowest, the, the biggest, um, and nicotine, um, the biggest side effect was low birth weight. Well, that didn't bother me. Low birth weight doesn't bother me. Um, so we put willing to discuss on certain topics. Um, I will tell you, I once got presented with a circumstance and I don't even know how this slipped through the cracks because I wouldn't have said it, but a, a mother who was addicted to crystal meth chose us and I had a connection with a neonatologist at CHOP 
who was my go-to for circumstances where I needed an education, right? Like as an adoptive parent, this is, this is a world outside of my own. I need to educate myself. And so I called her and she said, there is not enough research yet on what crystal meth does to a fetus. However, it eats away at the, the host eats away at their body. Can you imagine? And I, she didn't have, I, I mean, she didn't even have to say that to me. I knew it, but I wanted to do my homework. So we said no to that situation. And again, whoever is listening can judge me all they want. You're not in my shoes. And I've learned to just say that you can come at me. It's fine. You can disagree with me. It's fine. This is a decision I made. And it's funny, the people who usually come at me have nothing to do with adoption. They've never adopted. So it's okay. Um, <laughs> But these were issues and, um, you know, there are birth parents who are schizophrenic. There are birth parents. There's a list, there's a list and you have to decide what you can live with. Now, a lot of them come, what I learned in all of this, having adopted twice, um, is that a lot of birth mothers will say they have depression. And what I started to ask was, okay, have you actually been diagnosed with depression or is it circumstantial? Because I had depression from being infertile and having miscarriages. I could only imagine that at this unplanned moment in their life, everything's not okay. Um, so, you know, you learned they're human beings, right? Like this was it. Like I, I developed a new level of compassion, I think, just in learning what birth mothers went through. And I've really learned over the last 16 years, eight how old is she? 18 years of being involved in this industry. Um, a new level of compassion for the human struggle, right? Like we're just all trying to get through the day and some people's struggles are uglier than others. Um, but to judge them and not be supportive and compassionate is just not okay. And I always tell people, if you are matched with a birth mother and you can't get past her mistakes or what you think is the wrong way to do things, then please pass on that situation because you need to love this woman in spite of everything that's different from you, because that is the blood that will course through your children's veins. And, you know, we all live different lives. We all have different levels of what's right and what's wrong. And if you can't live with the decisions, then please move on. Someone, she will find the right fit, um, you know. And so with your girls, their mothers, did their mothers drink? Because you had said so, you didn't want anybody that, that. Well, that's where this story takes an interesting twist. <laughs> it's what I thought. What happened? So both of these, both of my, and, and let me just say this. I say these stories with all the respect and love in the world. And we talk about this openly as a family. My girls, if they were sitting next to me here would be part of this discussion, but they are at school. Because this is real for not just adoptive families, but this is real for adoptive families. And they will not be the only adoptees going through things like this in their lives. And I will not be the only adoptive mother going through this in their lives. So everything I talk about openly, even if it's ugly, is to help give someone else the strength to say, maybe I can deal with this. Yeah. Okay. Maybe feel I can alone. We do not want maybe anyone I can to feel stand alone. up for my kid. Maybe I can stand up for myself. Maybe I can stand up for someone else. Because it's happening. It's happening whether you stand up or not. So you better stand up is what I have to say. Um, both of my children's birth mothers were as healthy as I am when they were pregnant and gave birth to my children. Jane was discharged from the hospital in 48 hours. Brooke was discharged from the hospital in 24 hours. So if there's any doubt, there's your proof in the pudding. Any child born with any substance in their body is not discharged in those time periods. Okay, so there's the first fact. The second fact is, and I'll just fast forward, at some point in both of these young women's lives, substance came into the picture. Um, my daughter, Brooke's birth mother, Kelly, died when my daughter was eight years old of what I believe to be an accidental heroin overdose. 
Um, she became an alcoholic when Brooke was probably about five. And we talk about our children's birth mothers all the time in our household. And um, so when Brooke was eight, I had no choice but to tell Brooke what happened. And I am not the mother who will just say, oh, she got sick and died. Uh, we talked about it. We talked about why. And I have to tell you, so Brooke was in third grade. Um, Jane was 11. We talked about this. Um, we also, you know, again, I live in New York City. It doesn't really matter where you live. You know that as well as I do. But I live in New York City. So this stuff's out on the street. This is in the parks. This stuff's everywhere. So, um, yeah, I told my third grader about alcoholism and um, my, what was Jane's sixth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade and heroin and what happens when you OD and what happens when you have addiction and you make bad decisions. And then I also had to add in to both conversations, being an addict does not make you a bad person mm -hmm. because I'm now sort of as a mom by adoption, delivering someone else's news to a child that might say, that's my blood, that, that my birth mother was bad, therefore I'm bad, right? Like that, you don't know what a child's thinking. So I had to be very clear that addiction is a disease and I had to get educated a little bit. I did call in a therapist who specializes in this because I said, am I going to say the right thing, please? And it was a great, it's the smartest thing I ever did, um, you know, it, because my kids get it. My kids get it. And now we talk about, you know, the difference in social drinking and non-social drinking. And you might not ever be able to drink. You might not. And if I had to go to, a, I don't really drink that much anymore either. I'm 53. It doesn't make me feel good. So honestly, if I had to go to a dry house tomorrow, it's like easiest thing I could do. Do I like to have a drink when I go out to dinner? Yes. But if I had to give it all up, I don't really care because it's for me, thank God that's an easy give up. And if that's what my girls need for the support of like, you know, you might not be able to drink. All this looks very fancy and fun. You and I have had these conversations, Elizabeth. Yes, but like, have. you know, I don't like having these conversations. And I tell my kids like all the time. I just, Jane's birth mother, I had a call with her last week. And I done talked to Jane after the call. And I was like, I don't really like having these conversations with you, but I will never withhold this information. Right? Like, yeah. And if she, if Victoria were sitting here, She'd be part of the conversation. She knows she's, this isn't a great choice. She knows it's not a good decision. Mm. Um, it's really a hard thing. It's a hard, hard thing. And, um, you know, so now I'm in it. And, it. and it's not what I signed up for because I tried to avoid this factor in my preferences. Tried to avoid this factor. And here it comes. So I always tell people that too in adoption. Like you can do your best, but your story is your story. Um, and I think it's interesting. You brought up a couple points for one. I had a woman on last Monday who was actually on this American life. She was on a call. Never use alone is the company. It's a nonprofit also that, so if you, if you relapse, which most people do, you can go home and you use heroin by yourself. And before it's a nurse on the phone with you and the nurse was on the call with what was on this, this podcast. And she was on my podcast last week. And she talked about addiction as so many people thinking it's you're dirty, you're dirty. And did you pick up your dirty? And she said the smartest thing ever. She's like, did you take a bath today? Did you brush your teeth today? And most people will say yes. So does that mean you're dirty? No. Addiction is a disease, just like cancer. And it affects more families than that. And we, before we were recording, we did say, oh my gosh, it's so, it's a miracle that it, it hasn't affected your family. Like, cause it's so rare. That's what's so weird. I mean, I, more than you ever wanted to know, like I, you know, my family doesn't have a drop of alcoholism in it, which is very strange. Um, we do have suicide and depression. So, yeah. you know, the, we're not guilt uh, out of this, like scot-free. <laughs> um, but for your, and you're right that I have something somewhere with all different because the suicide we and depression, we didn't really talk about that a lot growing up either, but there's something about, 
I don't know, my wiring. I don't know what it is. Well, you but I just gene. knew. I just knew. I'm like, not. Nah, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. And I sh- actually, I should, I should, I'm sorry. We had, my uncle was a drug addict. I don't believe he was, um, he died when I was eight. Um, he was a heroin addict and died of an overdose. I don't believe that um, he was an alcoholic, but again, not really talked about. Yeah. Not talked not about. Not really talked about. But I do think because I was told how he died, I do think that's why part of the reason I never touched drugs. Because believe me, I was around it growing up. Yeah. I, I was like any other teenager. It was at parties. I mean, I'm still I'm 53 years old. People are still doing this stuff. I They're know. like, we don't have enough for you. I'm like, that's fine. Thank <laughs> you. Um, <laughs> it's so, crazy. I mean, I'm shocked. <laughs> I mean, I'm 55 and my friend went on a date and she's like, oh my gosh, the guy went to the bathroom and came back like, oh, and she's like, are people still doing this crap? It's crazy. So when you, all right, I want to go back to help us adopt. So when you started help us adopt and you, so, and you did your first adoption for someone else. I know. Will you tell us about that? You know, it's, it's, I am going to cry because it was one of those things where, um, you know, it was 2007. I sent out a friends and family letter to 600 people in June saying, this is our story. You know me. This is what we're doing with our story. I hope you will support it or ask questions in any way. I didn't directly ask for money because I back then didn't know how and was scared to death because the world trains us also to be scared to death and ask for money. Now I ask for money. Um, and it doesn't scare me to death because I know what I can do with it. I can change the world with it. I can cha- put a kid in. Yeah. So that's a different story for two questions from now. But back then, um, so in my first six months, I mean, I, I went to the PO box a couple weeks after I wrote, sent out that letter and I'm like looking in like, and there were envelopes and one was for $15,000 and, you know, um, people believed now don't get too excited because this is my other thing. For as many as believed, oh, there was a line of people. She has no business doing this. What is she doing? Blah, 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 blah. What are they saying now, 16 years later? Thank God I did this. Because the I'll tell you, that's another question. But like giving the first round of grants away. So in 2000, we raised $130,000 in mm-hmm. six months in 2007 mm-hmm. without asking for it. Mm-hmm. So that was interesting. Learning experience. Um, we gave a hundred away in 2008 and I still am friends on social media with those first families. I don't make the calls anymore. We're now so big. I have a program director, Erin, who's amazing. And she handles all of that. I'm still involved in the decision process, but I don't do the relationship. I don't make the calls and I don't talk to them as much. Um, but I'm still friends with those first few people. And you know, how did just, they find you? How did those families find you? Because I know that you sent the six. Were they from those six hundred letters, or how did they find? No, you? no. So I did an additional mailing. Two things. Number one, I'm a marketer and a brander, so like, sort of knew what I, I knew a little bit about what I was doing. Um, I sent out an additional like seven hundred letters to adoption professionals around the country saying, this is what we're doing. Send your clients our way. So that helped. And then I don't remember if Facebook for our age group was up by then or working by then. I I really don't remember, but like, you know, they found us, they found us. And now social media and all the press we've gotten helps and Google search. It was probably Google searches that helped. But one of the things that helped specifically, um, and the reason we started Help Us Adopt is that nothing else existed like Help Us Adopt. I didn't grow up thinking I'm going to do this. I didn't have all these miscarriages and adopt my kids. And I go, oh, it's because I want to start a nonprofit. It's not, it, it, this was never the plan. The plan had to happen because at the time, and still sadly today, the adoption grant programs out there, which they're not a lot, they give 
some give grants of $500 and I'm so sorry. Why? Adoption costs 50 or $60,000 and you're going to raise your money and give someone five. <sighs> That's not helping the problem. That's a Costco um, run. It's not helping the problem because the bottom line is they, st I, have, I have to then still give a big grant. Like you're not solving anybody's problem. And so that was a big problem to me. I'm like, why do all this work? to not solve someone's problem. And what do you tell your donors that they still can't afford adoption, but thank you for your donation. So the other piece that was drastically wrong, and I will say this with how other people do business, is they're not inclusive, Elizabeth. Jesus, they only want to help white heterosexual couples who worship a Christian God. Come on, we're better than that. We are better than that. Come on. So helpusadopt.org had to exist. And now I get really pissed because we help everybody. I mean, so one of my first grant recipients, I'll never forget it. And I'll never forget her. And I think we will always be friends. And we have actually met in person. I have not met a lot of the six, most of the 660 something families. She's a single woman. And she thought this is too good to be true. She thought you she's were like, too good to be true. Help us adopt is not really. She's like, work. there's no way. They've never given money away before. She says she's this. Who is this woman? She says she's helping single women. She's like, well, I'm going to fill it out. I have nothing to lose. She got a grant. I think she got $15,000 too. Um, we help single people. We help people of color. We help gay and lesbians. We help, I mean, you different religions. Like, here's the deal. This whole religion thing too, it really makes me mad. Because the whole point of religion is kindness. It's kindness. You can have a different way you do religion. But at the end of the day, it's about kindness and humans and taking care of each other. And so when I see these other grant organizations that say, I'm sorry, we won't help this person, this person, this person, and this person because we're so religious, that's no religion I want to be a part of. I want to be part of religion that says, we're building a better world. And that's what we do at helpusadopt.org. We're building a better world. We are inclusive and we are building families that are strong, that are interesting, that have great stories, that are hardworking, and that these families want nothing else than to love this child. That's it. And at the end of the day, that's what I do. That's I'm, what I do all day long. That's what our board does. That's what our donors do. We are building families who want to love these children. And these children need love. It's these just, children need love. You're amazing. I could talk to you for the entire day, as you know. We could keep going and going and going and going and going. We're like at an hour right now. So I I'm going to let you go. But I'm going to tell people that if you want to go find Becky, she's on all social media. I'm going to have all of her links with her description and she's about love and she's about every we're about baby. love this yeah. is it and it's it's about acceptance and come as you are and you know it's like the all the cliches we are building the biggest table possible come have a seat i love that because you know what too many people are being mean obviously what's going on in the world i mean it's just we're living in one of the scariest times ever there's a lot of darkness which i can't stand but we're here to spread the light and Becky is the light and she's giving, I mean, she's got this beautiful family and she's helping build families all over. It's, are you just in the U S or all over the world? Well, we have global impact because children are coming home from all over the world, but we help American families build their families. I love that. I love that. Yeah. I love you. Thank you so much for saying love you. It was Thank so you great. for having me on. I hope and let's can... change the world together. Let's do it. We, you know, I'm ready. We got to keep getting busy, living sober, baby. Thanks so much. And until next time, everybody, keep getting busy, living sober. Take care. Bye bye.